Are you ready for this episode? I don't think you can be ready. You can't be ready for this episode because it's one of, uh, I got so many favorite episodes, so how can I say one of my favorite? But this was a fantastic interview and a fantastic conversation with uh, someone that I really connected with. Uh, myself and Dean had the pleasure of interviewing today, Jared Hope. And you're gonna love this episode because Jared, you know, the amount of experience this guy has from uh, owning hundreds of properties to a real estate management company to to almost losing everything and going into bankruptcy to reestablishing himself and basically figuring things out, you know, 15 years later, he's got a lot of information, a lot of education. So I'm really excited. And this will be actually part of a series with Jared. This is the first part. And we're gonna be talking today, tailing our conversation around people, you know, maybe under 30 years old or younger people that are wondering, how the heck do I even get into real estate investing if I can't own a home? So we tailored our conversation, but before you turn off because you're, you know, 35 or 45 or whatever you are, this episode really fits anybody. You can listen to this and really get a lot of nuggets, especially if you're really trying to understand his story and some of the suggestions that Jared makes. So again, stay tuned. Let us know if you're loving this stuff because we've got more content coming up with Jared in the near future to educate our homeowners. Guys, as always, one of our favorite things, uh, well, one of my favorite things is to, to share with you the five-star review of the week. Please leave us the five-star review. Shout us out on iTunes. Send us an Instagram a message, a Facebook share. Shoot it to your friends and family. This is the juice that keeps us going. Myself, Dean, and Derek, of course, and our producer, Mr. Paul, DJ Paul, absolutely love seeing these shout outs, absolutely love seeing these reviews, and we, we do enjoy reading them. Again, if you do leave that five-star review, let us know who you are so we can send you that delicious coffee and that beautiful Thrive Positivity mug so we can keep your day going strong. So this week's review comes from <clears throat> excuse me ottawa young investor as a young investor these guys explain everything in an extremely easy to understand way i love that they give real life examples and always give the trends in the ongoing markets they're active on instagram and have live videos often excellent informative podcast for anyone looking to start or just learn more about real estate thank you so much ottawa young investor um you know we tailor our conversations to people just generally speaking learning how to get involved in real estate and do it in a way that makes them money saves them money or just makes it a lot easier. Of course, we're happy that you're listening to this. Again, on behalf of myself, Alex McFadden, my partner, Dean Lawton, and our missing compadre today, uh, Derek Williamson, we are so pumped to have you guys come and listen to this episode. If you wanna learn more about building wealth in your portfolio, make sure to reach out to us at Thrive Mortgage Co. Check out our website, send us a message so we can set up a, a phone call with you and learn more about your situation. And we'll talk to y'all very soon. What's up, guys? You are listening to the YBR Remo Show, where we talk all things Vancouver real estate and mortgages, take boring topics, and make them interesting. Make sure to stay tuned to listen to everything you need to know how to put cash back in your pocket, create wealth in real estate, and simplify the complicated. All right, all right, all right, all right. So let's get let's get right into it. Um, you know, Jared, thanks so much, man, for coming and joining us today, buddy. It's uh, it's a uh, it's a pleasure to have you on. I know we connected just recently through uh, through a few people and social media, which is always fun. And um, yeah, I, I can't believe that you know between us we haven't had a chance to connect a little bit earlier on, uh, seeing as uh, you're doing amazing things in the game. But you've been hibernation for the last uh, few months, right? Well, first of all, let me say I'm like a, a long-time listener, first-time caller uh, of your Bison's podcast. So like, I'm like a fanboy right now. So um, I watch what you're doing on social media, dude. It's pretty rad. So um, yeah, no, you know, the last, since the pandemic, things have just been so chill. It's been pretty rad. Um, you know, as, as, aside from all the stresses that come with running a portfolio of our size and a property management division and stuff like that. You know, the pandemic has been actually pretty good. So we started a renovation back in November. We bought a house on, uh, lucked out, uh, found a house on, on Lake Okanagan. Uh, we live in Kelowna. So we, we found a house on the lake here. We've been looking for the last year and a half. And, and it was at the start of the pandemic. And this guy had it listed for 4.2 and kept on dropping his price at the start of the pandemic. And we ended up picking up for 3 million, which is rad. I uh, like to get a house on the lake for 3 mil. It's pretty, uh, pretty unbelievable and then we've been renovating it so for the last six months we've been doing a reno and we just moved in two weeks ago and it's pretty rad so yeah that's got to feel nice man it's feel nice living in the new home how, how are you liking it so far 
Uh, you know, it, it, it's awesome. You know, like I was just talking to a client the other day and he's like, you know, how's life? And I'm like, dude, it's so good. He's like, oh, you must be busy with tilt. I'm like, not really. I maybe spend two hours a week uh, working at my company. And like life is, I, if someone would have told me back when I was two, in 2003, when I was 25 years old, when we bought our first house, that this would be the life that I would have. I never would have believed it. I never would have believed it. I heard stories about how real estate is the true wealth and you know, that's how most millionaires have real estate. And I heard, read all these books, but I didn't know how to, like, it was, I didn't know, like I've never had money before back in 2000, you know, 2003 when I was 25 years old, we were just doing it, hoping that it worked. And man, like life is pretty, pretty rad. It's pretty good. That leads us right off the bat. I mean, for anybody listening or everybody listening, of course, the episode right now, I mean, there's some people who may not have been introduced to you because a lot of our listeners in British Columbia, we have some in Alberta and throughout uh, through Canada as well. I mean, uh, Jared, you've got a really cool backstory and I think we'll take a, we'll take a little bit of a quick snake through as we have our conversation. But before I get into that, I mean, what I heard from what you just said right there had a lot actually to do with a, a mindset and an approach that uh, has probably shifted over time. And um, I think that's one of the things that we always tried throughout our podcast to emphasize to a lot of the people listening whether they're in the real estate industry or whether they're borrowers or, or people trying to get into the market is that just like this is just like running any business in life a lot of it has to you know how you think about it and how you prepare and how you set yourself up mentally and how you focus uh, case in point would be tilt management group which I, I hope you can touch on in a quick minute here um, and the fact that you said you spent two to three hours a week working on that and and that's a shift for a lot of people who grind for 60 80 100 hours in their jobs uh, you set yourself up through systems and checklists and, and procedures and things of that nature to allow the business to run itself, which is the true goal, I think, at the end of the day. So without going too far into that, um, you know, Jared, we got to always touch on the backstory a little bit here. So um, maybe give us like a little bit of a um, for anybody who has not been initiated, a little run through of kind of like your your key milestones. And then let's touch on let's touch on tilt and, and get right into it. First of all, I want to touch on something you just said. You, you know, you mentioned how owning real estate is like it's like a business. You know, it is a business, and I actually think people who are in the under the age of thirty and they're buying their first house, they should actually be thinking in that mentality of, hey, let's be honest. Like, it's your first house; you're not going to live in it forever. Odds of you living in that house forever are so rare; it's just likely not going to happen. So, if you think of the mindset of, hey, how do I keep? How do I buy the next property that's going to make me wealth in ten, fifteen years? Play the game that way. So your next two or three purchases should be with the mentality of, I'm going to try to cre run this as a business to make me wealth. Okay. So, and we'll get into that topic for sure. Um, so our story started back in 2003. My wife, you know, I, I had zero interest in being a real, real estate person. I had zero interest in owning real estate. I was of the mindset of the poor dad, if you reference rich dad, poor dad. And my wife was of the mindset of rich dad. So her parents were you know, entrepreneurs, they were farmers, they had a SO bulk station, they were, uh, you know, always, they were buying bison, so they were grain farmers and bison farmers, they had this bulk station, uh, gas station. So Krista was taught to work for yourself and be your own boss and be an entrepreneur, or be a business owner. I was taught, to, and nothing against how I was taught, it's just two different views, right? And I was taught to go to school and get your grades and go work for the man and, you know, slug it out for 30 years and get your pension. And what I started to realize is no companies have pensions anymore. Like those days are gone. RSPs are shit. Uh, you know, mutuals are shit. And stocks are shit, in my opinion. I don't have one stock. And so we started, we went to this real estate course and we ended up signing up. And at that time, we couldn't afford shit. We couldn't even afford the $200 a month um, membership fee. But we signed up and six months later, we bought our first house. And that year we bought three. The next year we bought eight. The next year we bought 64. The next year we bought 32 and 34 and 25. We just kept on buying. And it, like, for the average person hearing that story, they're like, oh my God, that's so rad. You must've been rolling in the dough. Well, yeah, sure. But the, the mistakes that we made were so unbelievable. And what, what I realize now is that buying in a hot market, everyone looks like a genius. And that's part of the problem that we're seeing right now in this economy. You look what's happening in Vancouver or even be all of BC, ex except for maybe the North. You look what's happening in, in the GTA or Ontario or the, the South of Ontario. You know, like there's all these rookie, I'm going to call rookie investors. And a rookie investor could be 50 years old. It doesn't matter. Uh, but there's all these new investors that are getting out and having some early success. And then they're out thinking that they're a superstar because they've made $100,000 in the last two years. 
Now, in a hot market, everyone looks like a genius. In a down market, everyone looks like a moron. And so when the market shifted in 2008, all of, our, all of these great rewards that we thought we accomplished were starting to crumble underneath us. Because in 2008, we had that financial recession. And all of a sudden, you know, my rents dropped 20, 25%. My vacancy rate went up from 1% to 20%. My tenant turnover was through the, like it was just out of control that all of a sudden I started to realize I was playing the game wrong. I was following advice from people that just didn't know how to play the game. I was listening to people up on stage who I thought they were smart, but when you actually look behind the scenes, they only had one or two properties or they were getting paid to be on stage. And then I was like, it was, it was, so there's a, there's a, and I'm not blaming anybody. It was just the, it was just the way the situation was. We went off and built all this real estate that turned out to blow up in our faces back in 2008. So come 2010, we had to restructure everything to the point where I had to make my portfolio uh, uh, recession proof. And 2016, we hit another recession in Alberta and we smoked through it. I made more money in 2016 and 17 and 18 than I ever have before in my life in the middle of a recession in Alberta. So then along, and, I'm, and I know I'm kind of jumping all over the place or I'm speeding up and I'm, I'm going to back up here in a bit. And then, and then we had to restructure our pool. Well, sorry, I didn't I restructure our portfolio to make us recession proof, which was awesome. But then the pandemic hit and I'm like, holy fuck, like I'm going to go broke. I have a hundred plus properties. I'm going to go like, what if these tenants don't pay rent? Like I'm screwed. Cause that's all that, that was all the media, you know, don't pay rent. You don't have to pay rent. No, no rent increases, so on and so on. And, you know, we got through the pandemic relatively smooth. Uh, you know, so what I've realized is that the way we restructured our portfolio in 2010, we changed the way the game was being played. And it, it's made our portfolio 10 years later, 11 years later, pandemic proof. And, you know, what people need to realize, which I didn't realize back then, is there's, you don't need 100 properties. You know, you don't, everyone wants 100 properties, but you don't need it. Like, what if you could do it in 10? What if you could buy one a year for the next eight years and rinse and repeat for the next eight years and 16 years later, you have 26 properties that's doing $45,000 a month of cash flow and your quality of life is through the roof and your stress levels are way down here. So these big groups that are teaching all this shit and this stuff on YouTube and like these uneducated investors or sorry, realtors or mortgage brokers are giving the wrong advice, which is why we created Tilt. So we created Tilt Property Group uh, you know, in 2010, but we officially rebranded it as Tilt Proper Group in 2017 because it's like this one-stop shop for real estate investors. You know, like, you call me up, I'll, I'll tell you the truth. I'll tell you to buy that house. I'll tell you not to buy that place. I'll tell you to buy in Ontario. I'll tell you not to buy in Ontario. I'll tell you where to buy. I play the game every single day, and that's the biggest thing about our program, even our coaching program, is I, I'm still playing the game. I'm trying to buy a house right now. I've So far this year, I've bought 12 houses this year. You know, go talk to any other investor like me or coach like me. They're not, odds are they're not buying anything. So how can you give advice? Yeah, there's a lot, a lot there, man, a lot to take out of it. But I mean, I think let's just go back a few steps here. So, I mean, uh, for anybody listening to the first portion of what you said there around, you know, just kind of changing your mindset from that blue collar, uh, stick my money into um, stocks or pension RSP. I mean, that hits home for obviously Dean and I here because uh, we're self-employed and we're actually constantly looking for opportunities as business owners, but it wasn't always that way. Uh, just like you, my, my dad was blue collar, worked in a mill. Uh, his entire life and mom stayed at home took care of us right so the mindset wasn't necessarily like let's acquire properties it's like let's pay off our mortgage and we're good to go and and I mean Dean could probably jump in here in a second but I think the vast majority of people would agree that it's always uh, what we hear uh, from or most of our clients that we're talking to you get the odd person like uh, who's enlightened because they see someone else who again maybe made some money off some appreciation and it's kind of strike their interest or something of that nature but I think that that's like really Really what we want to key in on and have that conversation i think that model works like I, I don't actually have a problem with buy a house and pay it off i have no issue with that you know it's just like because not i'm not trying to convince anybody to be a real estate investor i'm just saying if you have a little bit of an interest in it like the, the truth is and i say this all the time and we actually have a podcast called the truth is but the truth is at 22 years old or 24 years old, at 25 years old, all you know is your last 25 years of life. That's it. And then plus whatever you hear people tell you, that's it. But you actually don't know what the journey is going to be. 
So why not, if you're buying your first property, why not entertain the idea of what if this is an asset? A house, a primary residence is not an asset. It's a liability in the first like 10, 15 years because you're just paying off interest. You're paying, you're fixing it. It's just, it's just, gonna, it's going to cost you money, which is fine. And, but what if 10 years from now, now you're 35 years old. Now you want to get into real estate. And now that first house, you've played the game for 10 years all wrong. Like there are people, stocks work, RSPs work, mutuals work. I think that the way the game should be played is, Go front end load those mutuals and RSPs because banks like those for lending because they look at that as security. They look at that as protection. They're going to qualify you because you have high RSPs. Go buy a house, start filling the funnel over here of of investments that get high cash flow that you can then cash those out and then go acquire more real estate because now you don't, you're not so dependent on these mutuals and RSPs because you need to get a history of your company over here that has strong cash flow. But a rookie investor, a new investor, sure, go go load up on RSPs and mutuals, but use it as leverage to acquire real estate. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I think from what hit, hit home for me is just that business mindset, even with your primary residence, even if that is your only home, like looking at that as a business, I think that's where a lot of people do go wrong because they don't look at that as an asset that can continue to grow and leverage from, you know, even if that is the home forever which and as we all know it's very unlikely that would be your forever home but even if that is your forever home like what you can do with that appreciation and that equity to buy the next one to buy the third one that i think just that shift of mindset of getting in getting that business minded approach is is where a lot of our clients don't think that way when we first get introduced to them because a lot of them are in great jobs they're making great money with an employer so they have that employee mindset which it's not a bad thing, but when you take that into the real estate side, that's where they kind of get really, it's just, it's just such a, I don't know how to say it, but it's just, it's closed minded in a way. Dude, this is exactly why we want to run or we're launching our under 30 program. This exact same conversation is because I'm watching, you know, I was talking to a lady the other day, um, a, a girl, she's like 21 years old. Uh, her name's Morgan. So Krista's best friend calls calls me up and uh, she's like, hey, I need you to talk to my daughter because she wants to get into real estate investing and she doesn't know if she wants to be a realtor, property manager, own it. She has no idea, 21 years old. So I'm sitting there chatting with Morgan. I do this hour and 10, hour and 15 minute Zoom call with her. And on this Zoom call, like I'm just explaining all the benefits of real estate and how I'd play the game and just no different than what we're gonna go through here in the next you know, three hours of conversation, whatever this podcast is gonna be. I'm kidding, it won't be three hours. But so I hang up the phone, I, I close the Zoom call with her, and I turn to my wife, Chris, I'm like, holy shit, I'm going to start up an under 30 program. Because these, these, these kids do not understand how real estate can really leverage things out. So, you know, so it's not that they, to be honest, kids under, people under the age of 30, they don't really understand how to run a business, period. You know, like even people under the age of 50 or 30 to 50 don't understand how to run a business but I want to teach them. So I'm going to teach them how the power of leverage, I'm going to teach them how not to be leveraged out. I'm going to teach them because that's another mistake people make. They keep on refinancing their primary residence. It's like, don't do that. Like it's okay to play the game at the start like that, but at some point in time, you got to get away from it, I think. And so, but I'm going to teach these under 30, how to attract money, how to find the right property that's going to work, how to, you know, uh, do joint venture partners, how to, how to, what types of properties work. Because the truth is, Dean, they're not being taught that. So their influence is their parents. Nine times out of 10, their parents are people who are just paying off their debt for the next 25, 30 years, and they believe that real estate is their asset. One piece of real estate, and that's a total cool mindset. However, there might be a different way to play it, and I wanna educate these guys. That's cool to hear because that generation is so fixated on being an entrepreneur it's like being an entrepreneur is just such a cool thing now where with the older generation that wasn't the case right it was the we all had blue collar parents that just you know beat the hammer every day and went to work but now it's so cool to be an entrepreneur but they go i just think they're going into it closed-minded and not you know that education that you're providing is 
second to none. Uh, so, so like on that note, just to piggyback on what Dean's saying right there, and actually something I heard you say, Jared, right off the bat. So like you mentioned, obviously, in your first couple of years, you guys acquired like 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, like you acquired a lot of properties. Now, I think the first thing we need to explain to people is like this was in a different lending climate, first and foremost. So uh, the climate of lending was very different. So taking that approach today is a very different. Um, it's very different than what it was before. And strategy is is so important, which is why, you know, a guy like you kind of sharing my mistakes is going to set you back or, or set you forward 5, 10, 15 years versus the past. So that's kind of neat. The second thing I, I heard you say there that I want to key in on is that, hey, listen, a lot of people don't need to own, you know, 50 uh, properties or 100 properties. I think that's that it, I would agree with that. I, I, you know, maybe I don't want to own 50 or 60 or 70 or 100 properties necessarily, but but getting to five could change your life, right? Uh, getting to, to three, four, five. Five will change your life. You know, if you buy five properties over the next five years, one year, keep it really simple. And, you know, those five properties say they, depending on where you buy, say they cash flow $500 a month. That's $2,500 a month off those five. Fast forward, if you just play the game the old conventional way, pay it down for the next 25 years, blah, 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 whatever everyone, whatever, whatever everyone else teaches, in 25 years, let's just say rents are the same and it's still $3,000. You're now making fifteen what $15,000 a month of revenue. Like it will change your life. And if you, if you start the game at 30 years old or at 25 years old, now you're 50, 55 years old doing $15,000 a month and you have $2.5 million or $3 million worth of assets. It will change your life. You know, so first of all, I want to clear up something. You're right. Back in the day when I started buying real estate in 2008 or in 2003, the game was different. I could walk into the bank and the bank would be like, oh, you're breathing? Yeah, here's a mortgage. Here's a mortgage. They were just, they were just handing them out like crazy. But I didn't go acquire 100 properties in my own name. I got to 13 in my own name. And then I ran out of money. And then I had to build with investors. So from 13 to 120, I have investors, which I've now bought out. So, you know, like I've bought the houses in my own name. I've raised something like $28 million of capital. I've done $140 million worth of renovations. Like I've played every aspect of this game. And I look at... Getting to 13 for me back in 2003 is probably the equivalent of getting to three or four today where banks start changing the rules. I got too many. I got to go over here and I got to get the B lenders and you got to go private money. So it's about three or four. So the concepts are still the same. The big difference between me and anyone else is I'm still playing the game today. Whereas all these other coaches and investors, they got to three, four or five, or even they might've got to 20 or 30, 10, 15 years ago, but they're not playing the game today. So the rules are different, tenant profiles are different, properties are different, areas are different, understanding the markets are different. You're like Everything's different than it was 15 years ago. What I was doing 15 years ago does not work today, period. But a lot of the principles that you had before still apply. And I think uh, that's where that's where the benefit of, you know, obviously working with you as a coach or program can make a lot of sense. Uh, let's go back to the under 30 crowd because we want to focus our energy today on uh, those people who are listening and buying their first or second investment. And, or, and, and, this, and again, to be clear, like this doesn't you have don't have to be under 30. You can be 31, 32, whatever. We're just trying to let you know, like uh, a lot of people are buying their first home and first property or first investment in that younger age category. And one of the biggest barriers is I don't have the experience. Experience. I just got to get into my first home. Um, I, you know, I don't know what to do. And, I, and and my experience has been, to be honest with you, uh, only recently have I seen a lot more younger people like kind of open their minds to this idea because of entrepreneurship and business ownership being bigger. But typically, like uh, you know, Jared, most of the people we're talking to that are interested in investments are 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 a little bit later in life. You know, they've got some kids, and their kids are maybe like you know past ten years old, and they're like, holy crap, like. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I, I got to figure out a retirement plan. I got to go. So, so one of the things that we want to do is open ideas and minds of younger individuals and say, like, you can do this. Uh, you can get into the market. And so, so why do you think it's it's a really good idea for younger folks to be starting and having that mindset right now? And you know, what are some of the things and recommendations that you're making immediately to those uh, to those folks? Great question. If I'll, I'm going to answer, I'm going to ask myself a question, which I'll answer. And my my question I would ask myself is, if, if I was 25, what would I do? If I was 25 years old again, starting out, what would I do? And I would house hack. I would buy a house for 5% because you have the ability to do it, buy a house for 5% and you know, so you go buy a half a million dollar house, come up with 25 grand, I would, I would borrow the money from my dad, I would go get a job and save it, what, sell my car or whatever, 
come up with this 25 grand to go buy, go buy a house. And I would live in that house, have a couple roommates, uh, cause I'm 25. Like I, I got no kids. Uh, well, hopefully I got no kids at that point. Uh, you know, I, I can, I could pack lights. Uh, you know, it's pretty easy to pick up and move and then do move, move a year later, but keep the house. And, you know, you can do that two or three times. Likely you, you would know this more than I would, but you could probably do this one, two, three times. So now you can actually acquire your first few houses with very little down. When I go to buy a house, I have to put 20% down. And, you know, so now I'm buying a house for a million dollars or $500,000. I'm putting a hundred grand into this thing. Whereas a first time investor can actually put 25 grand so they can build a bigger asset base than, than I can. Uh, you know, that's how I would play the game if, if I was starting out and I didn't have any money and I had no equity and I was fearful, you know, because instead of paying rent to somebody, I'd rather put that money towards something that I own, take on a few. That's what we did. We bought our first house in, in Edmonton. We couldn't afford shit. Like we were broke, guys. You know, it's not like it's not like I started this game with a million dollars. You know, like we legit had fifteen thousand dollars to our name. And that's not even true either, because when we bought our first house for one hundred forty. Uh, 147,000, 146 or something like that, $147,000, I had to borrow my half of the down payment, which was 10, we put 10% down. So, cause that's all we were allowed back then. We had to put, I had to borrow my half from my dad and Krista owned a condo with her mom that they sold. And Chris's half was like $10,000 of the profit. And Chris's mom made 10 grand. That's how we bought our first house. And we, it was a house with a basement suite. My mortgage payment was $847 a month. We rented out the basement for 550. We took on a roommate for 300. We were living for free. We did that for two years. That house went from 147, two years later went to like 300 and something. I refinanced it, went and bought three more properties, moved out of that one, bought, like that's how the game started. And that game, like I look at the opportunity right now for these young investors, like you know, everyone always says, oh, the market's too hot. The market's too hot. I missed it. I missed it. Or, you know, so fear stops them from getting in or greed makes them jump in. And I, I look at the market right now, and I actually think the market is probably one of the, depending on what area you're in, is probably one of the best markets to get started. Interest rates, man, like 2 point, what, what's a five-year fix right now? Like 2.2, 2.25? You know, the banks are whole. Yeah, banks are holding prime at, you know, whatever it is. They're, uh, uh, they just announced yesterday they're going to hold the interest rates. Um, you can get a variable rate for what, prime minus 0. 0.8, something like that, 0. 0.5, 0. 0.6, 0. 0.8. It gets unbelievable. My first mortgage was 7.2, 7.1%. You know, and I made it work. Whereas now you start looking at what, you know, you're coming out of the pandemic, you look at GDP growth, you look at activity in the market, you look at the travel industry, everyone's going to be dumping money and dumping opportunities back into the economy to make it pop. And we're starting to see that. Then you factor in interest rates and there's just a massive opportunity right now all over the country. Some are a little bit hotter than others, but there's still opportunity. Well, I think like first and foremost, opportunity is everywhere. You just have to be looking for it. So be present, be available and be ready to do so. Um, so uh, we're going to toot our, we're going to, any of the listeners here who've listened to our episodes from the beginning would, would have heard a lot of what you said and said, oh, I heard these guys talk about this before. So that's a good feeling to have, to have people say, you know, you know, obviously hear it from an expert like yourself and say that. I mean, we had a gentleman actually on our show, I think it was like the fifth episode. And what he did was uh, he, his parents set up a line of credit on their home, uh, in, in the real estate agent that uh, he was working with helped him purchase a, a house that had a two basement suites and a coach home and he literally rented out both suites and the coach home and he rented out a room in his house and he wasn't only living there for free he was being paid to live in that home uh, he lived in that home for a number of years uh, refinanced that purchased another property and then eventually sold it and bought a built a house which is one that he's made about a bunch of money on too which is a separate conversation but I think the first thing that you said right off the bat and I mean guys if you're if you haven't gone back and listened to we get a couple of episodes about housing hacks actually that we talked about and one of the things that we talked about was what you said jared which is uh get in do do the five percent you don't have to be a first-time buyer to do five percent you just have to be moving into the home right and you just have to qualify for it so five percent is all 
you need to get into it. Beg, borrow, steal from whoever you can to get in the home and rent out that second room. Get, you know, put somebody in there. Get them to, to help you own that. Uh, Kosi was one of our guests. He came on. He talked about it. He did that. We've got a lot of people who said the exact same thing. So remind, just a reminder to take that short term. I wouldn't even call that a loss, but maybe short term pain to have a roommate. Big deal uh, to make that move and be comfortable with, uh, you know, obviously transitioning properties out. I, I have a client, uh, she just bought her third property. She's been with us for a year and a half and she came to us, she was living with her mom, um, just out of town in Edmonton. And so we have clients all over the country, but this client is out of Edmonton. And so she comes to us and I'm like, oh my God, I'm like, you got a house act, like you gotta do this. So she went and bought this house uh, with a legal basement suite and it was 455,000 or something like that. She bought it, lived downstairs, rented out upstairs, did that for about eight months, six months, uh, bought another one, moved to that one, kept this one, moved to that one. And now she's just bought her third with 20% down. So now she bought a lake lot, a lake, a cabin on the lake, which is where she wants to go back to. So now these two properties are cash flowing $1,500 a month. It's in, it's in Edmonton, so cash flow is a lot higher in Alberta than in BC. So these two properties are now helping her offset the debt. And look, she makes good income anyway. She works up in Fort Mac. But now she's bought this property where she's able to acquire a million dollars of assets for $50,000. And her game is to, you know, she's just going to hang on to these for eight to 10 years. And she will r rinse and repeat that model over and over and over again. And when I, when I approached this to her, she's like, oh my God, I'm totally going to do that because I can, I, I can live in three or four boxes. So she legit lived in, on a couch and I shut her TV, her four or five, six boxes, whatever it was. And that, that was it. She did that for a year. And when I, when I first pitched this idea to her, I'm just like, listen, if you can make a million dollars in 20, in 20 years, would you not live in a, in boxes for six months or in eight months or in, for 10 months? And she's like, absolutely. I would. So she will make a million dollars from living out of boxes for one year. Like it's not, it's the like, guys, you're going to live to 80 years old, you know? So for these new investors, these, you know, these first time investors or these, these young kids, and we're going to, obviously we're talking about under 30, someone 50 could play this game too. It's just a little bit harder as you get older. Um, it's just a great concept. It's a great way to play the game as long as you can keep on qualifying. When you said that right there, sorry, Dean, to cut you off there. When you said that, I, I want to just quickly throw it out in there for, for you older folks listening to this. And we shouldn't even use the term older. I mean, uh, for folks that are above. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, old, I'm older. I'm older. <laughs> okay. So for all you Jer Jared age folks out there. No, it, it, to be honest with you, I think we just want to focus this around somebody who's young and has that ability. Again, if you're a different stage of your life or a different point, there's still an opportunity. It's just a different opportunity. So stay tuned because we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Dean, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say the key point is we have a ton of clients that come to us with expectations to buy that $500,000 home or whatever the price is and they don't qualify like they, their job doesn't allow them to qualify even with the five percent down it's just it's just not going to happen for them what's your advice to somebody that's so keen on getting into this industry but they just don't have that income bandwidth to get them into the market to actually buy a product that you would advise them to buy dude hire hire someone who can show you how you know like I've bought I've, I bet you I've transacted I bought 35 properties with no money down yeah, and they're called agreement for sale. So back in the day, it was called assumable mortgages, right? You know, I could take over your mortgage just like that. We just changed title and away we go. Whereas nowadays, those days are gone. So, but now there's something called agreement for sale. So I have transacted 30, 40 properties in an agreement for sale where I might give the person 10 grand. They hold the mortgage for me for the next 10 or 12 years. Legally, I own it. Technically, I own it. It all, it all fits in my company. They're out of the house. I get the house. I have to make all the payments and mortgages. Like, there's ways to buy real estate with no money or little to no money down. Um, joint venturing, raise capital. You know, like, it, it, everyone at some point in time will run out of money. Everybody, you know, of their own money. So it's at that point in time, whether it's on your first property or on your 10th property, it doesn't matter. At some point in time, every investor runs out of money. So then at, it's at, it's, that's when you, know, the, you, you smash through the wall and keep on going or you cradle the crater and just sit in, at home and watch TV. Like that's, that's the defining moment, I think. And raising capital, like why can't you go raise capital 
go to your parents and say, hey, listen, mom and dad, I got a business proposition for you. Let's go buy this house. You put the down payment in. You co-sign for me. We're going to be partners. And in five years, we're going to sell that house. I'm going to give you 50, I'm going to give you all your money back. Plus, I'm going to give you 50% of the profit and appreciation. And I'm going to take 50%. I was in the gym the other day with my trainer. So I'm working out with Luke. Phenomenal kid. 30 years old. Just a solid dude. And I'm working out with Luke and I'm like, dude, like, so I've been training with Luke for three and a half years now. And so I'm training with Luke and I'm like, dude, like, what's going on? Like, are you ever going to grow up? And so Luke, if you're listening, he listens to all my stuff. So I'm like, dude, this is like, sorry. And so I'm like, dude, are you ever going to grow up? He's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, when are you going to get out of the basement? Like he's renting a basement right now for a thousand bucks. And he's like, I can't afford it. Like houses here in Kelowna are through the roof. I said, I'll make you a deal. Here's the deal. Yeah, it's called hassle-free landlording. Uh, so I said, here's the deal. Let's go buy a townhouse for half a million dollars. You go buy it for 5%. He makes 80, 90 grand a year for sure. So I said, you go, you go qualify for the mortgage. I will, I will put 25 grand into your bank account right now. And in the next, you know, three months later, cause banks want to see the money into your account. We'll put the money into your account right now. We'll do a letter of intent. We'll do a contract that you can't take that money out. We'll put it in your account. You go get the mortgage. And I'm now your partner on that house. 30 years old. And he's like, well, what's the benefit to me? I'm like, you get a house. You are getting a house for free in five years. So over the next five years, you're going to cash me out. I'm going to get my original investment back. I'm going to get half the profit, half the appreciation, but so are you. So at that point in time, you can refinance the house to pay me out. You can sell the house to pay me out and go buy another one, or we can extend the deal. I don't really care. So as I'm talking to Luke, it's just coming out of my mouth because he's a, he's a buddy of mine. I get, I've known him for three and a half years. So I walk out of the gym and, and I'm with Chris. I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to run a program where I'm going to attract people like this. I would do this deal all day long with first-time investors. Have a contract, screen them, credit checks, vet them, get personal guarantees on them that protect my interest. But why wouldn't I go give... 10 people, 25 grand to go buy all this money because 10 years from now or five years from now, when we cash out, I'm going to make hundreds of thousands of dollars off of that money. And it's very little risk because they're going to pay the mortgage. They're going to clean it. They're going to cut the yard. There's no tenants to worry about. There's no rents to manage. I just got to tie up 25 grand. No brainer. Totally. So what, what would I say to these people? If you really want to do it, find a way. If you can't find a way, hire someone who can teach you how to do it. So I talked to people, like I talked to somebody the other day, she's like, uh, from Ontario, she's like, because uh, we're, we're starting some soft marketing for our under 30 program, which is like, it's like nine grand. Okay. So it's not cheap, but it's not crazy expensive. And it's a nine month program. And this lady comes up to me. She's like, oh, we're, we're, we're ch- uh, texting back and forth. She's like, it's too much money. I can't afford it. I'm like, cool. Well, what do you got? She's like, well, I have $15,000. I'm like, no offense. You can't afford a house. So if you can't afford to buy a house with 15 grand, go put the money into investing into yourself so you can learn how to acquire a house. Like, so she's sitting there trying to save this money at 15 grand versus spending nine grand to go learn how to buy the house. Cause I could have showed her in one conversation how to buy a house. So that nine grand, I would have quadrupled the value of that, you know, but the mindset of these, these under 30, it's like, Oh, I got to hoard my money because they're still thinking save to get rich. Well, it's impossible. What if you could spend the eight, nine grand, but I can, someone could teach you how to buy a house with no money down, how to raise, you know, a hundred thousand dollars, how to da, 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 da. You know, like I went up to my dad when I was, uh, when I first started and my dad told me, no, I went up to my dad. I'm like, dude, dad, I got this idea. I, I, I ran out of money. I got, I was getting to about eight, nine properties at that point in time. And I was starting to run out of money. So I, I went to my dad and I, bring out my whiteboard and I'm drawing all these houses and I'm drawing all, I'm crossing things out. I'm writing numbers down. It was the best sales presentation ever. And my dad comes back to me. He's like, no, I'm out because I've seen 20% interest. I've seen 21. This is too risky. So on and so on. If I would have stopped at that point in time, I would not be living in a $6 million house on the lake. I would not have uh, my boat. I would not be living in the Okanagan. I'd not be working two hours a week. Um, in my company. I just wouldn't have done. I would have stopped. I would have went back working for the man. And so I look back at that experience, which is kind of the same thing that you're saying. What if, you know, someone just can't do it. It's you should or get off the pot. You either want it bad enough or you don't. And most people, it's a dichotomy. Uh, I want to get in shape. 
I want to be fit, but I don't, I don't want to give up McDonald's. I don't want to work out. It's a, it's a dichotomy. I want it, but I don't want to do the work. It's a select few that sit there and say, I want it, and I'm willing to do the work. I'm willing to be misunderstood. And there's people that are going to be sitting there saying, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Those are the people that you just tune out, don't listen to them, start hanging out with the people that do want you to have success. That's your mortgage brokers who understand the game, who actually have your best interest. That's your realtors who understand the game and just don't want to get a paycheck. That's mentorship groups, uh, masterminds. Stay away from the big groups. Those big groups are not like-minded people. They are not like, you go to a room with 500 people, good luck finding someone who you can resonate with. They're all there for the same shit, in my opinion. And I've been in those big rooms. So back to your question, and this is many answers to your question for sure. What, you know, how does, what, what do I say to those people who just can't do it or don't want it or are having a hard time? Find a way. Because 10 years later, you'll be grateful you did. I love it. I love it. So there's so much there to digest, Jared. I think like everything from obviously, I mean, this all comes back to mindset, man, just shifting your mind around being able to do it. There's some gold nuggets in there. I mean, the the the, the idea of working together with someone, I think you called it a hassle-free landlord. We've heard different iterations and versions of that and talked about it before. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, it's it's just eliminating, uh, between you and I, Jared, it's just kind of eliminating a lot of the terms and scary thoughts and around it, like raising capital for a lot of people is what's capital? I don't even know what that is, right? Like, raising what am i raising like raising the roof or what's happening right like come on man like what what exactly is going it's like no 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 we're, we're getting cash for you to use to buy an investment property you're finding people who want to invest with you and you know like you just mentioned with your uh, trainer there uh just a, a, do a joint opportunity where he can benefit from you know you helping him get into the market you benefit because he's going to be paying the mortgage and he's going to be on a piece of real estate in five years from now right so um, a win-win scenario, and I think that's what we what we talk to a lot of people about right now is is find the scenarios that are win-win, uh, not short-term. Uh, the other thing that you mentioned over and over and over and over again, man, is long-term, five, ten. What what would it look like for you in ten years from now? Let's talk just quickly, touching on real-life scenarios, rent. I mean, I tell people my story all the time. I still own my first condo today, um, and at the time, it probably would would have rented out for maybe I don't know eight hundred, nine hundred bucks. Now it's I'm I'm giving the the, the you know the tenant a, a, a decent price point because i really like them but you know i could rent it out today for 1900 and this is nine years or 10 years later uh for that same property and so uh, if i if i keep this property for another 10 years if the rent looks like 2500 or, or three thousand dollars at that point in time you know again it's not like my mortgage is negatively affected i'm just getting more and more cash flow so having that mindset of getting in partnering using the five percent down these types of things are just so so key um uh, again, because we're going to have a second conversation, we're going to have you come back and talk a little bit to the crowd that's maybe already got the home and wants to know what to do with the home and what to look for. And I want to dig a little bit into the property management piece with you later. But are there any other tips or, or feedback that you have here for someone who's just like, man, how do I how do I get in? What do I do? What do I look for? Any thoughts around the actual property types? Yeah, man, I, I say all the time buying real estate's easy. Uh, getting your head around buying it's hard. And, you know, like so what... I see it all the time where someone who wants to get into real estate, what they'll do is they'll, they'll, they'll just start reading every real estate book out there and they'll start following YouTube and get the free stuff and they'll start listening to every podcast. There, there's a point where you, you actually take on too much information and, and then everyone you talk to is guiding you a different direction. And I could be sitting here talking about Regina, how Regina's hot, which is not, but how Regina's so hot, it's so hot. And then someone listening, they're, they're going to hop on a plane and fly to Regina and buy three houses in Regina because they think I said it was hot. You know, so you got to be careful with the advice you get. So the feedback I would give to, or the answer to this question is I would be spending my time on really mindset, on personal growth, on personal development, rich dad, poor dad, uh, the millionaire next door, uh, the big leap by Gay Hendricks. These are all books. The big leap is one of the best books I've ever read in my life. I've actually read that book a number of times and it's about your upper limit thinking. So we all have upper limit thinking and it's the upper limit thinking that prevents us from actually achieving a result because we actually start listening to the naysayers more than we actually listen to the yaysayers. And, you know, so by, as far as the type of property, there's so many different types of property. Like the, the mistake people make is they think they have to buy in their own backyard. 
And for the first time home buyer, for the, for the person, the young investor who's going to live in the house, obviously you want to buy in your backyard. But as far as an investment, you don't have to buy in Vancouver for an investment. I live in Kelowna, but all my stuff's in, in Edmonton. You know, you look at oil, you look at GDP, you look at the Rental Tenant Act. The Tenant Act in Alberta is the best in the country. I can raise rents once a year unlimited. Unlimited. Two years ago, we were doing four or $500 rent increases to the exact same tenant. In BC, it's 2%. In Ontario, it's 2%, but they have a rent freeze. I don't know if we have a rent freeze here in BC. But so then the mistake investors make a lot like you, Alex, is, oh, I got a really great tenant. I'm not going to raise the rent. But over year, over the year, your taxes go up, your interest rates go up, your property expenses go up, uh, labor goes up. So inflation is going to push costs up, but you're still not raising your rent. Three years later, you haven't raised rent 2%. You just missed out on all those rent increases. So which is actually going to hurt your lending power as you go to grow. So you want to make sure that you're playing the game properly. As far as real estate, I, I'm a big believer of two for the price of one, which means two suites for the, for in one house, suited houses, fourplexes, triplexes, renting out rooms. Um, you know, if you're young, rent out rooms. Who cares? You're going to make a pile of money in 10 years. Suck it up. Have iron tight, ironclad agreements with these people that if you don't like them, you can kick them out. Treat it like a business. Make them take security. They take security deposits. Hold the course and run it like a business because things go sideways. So I just wouldn't rent out to anybody. Um, but yeah, you know, buying real estate is easy. And I keep on saying that. It's, it's just, do you really want to do it? And if you do, go find someone who knows what they're doing and they'll guide you through it. I like it. I like it. Well, hold on a second here because I didn't say I don't ever increase rent. <laughs> Just uh, really, really like the people that are in there right now. And, uh, and I think it's obviously that's a subjective conversation, certainly. But I appreciate where you're coming from there. Um, so, do, yeah, multiple uh, sweet properties. We talk to people that all the time. Obviously, from a lending perspective, you buy one house, but you have two sources of rent or three sources of rent. That's key uh, from, you know, from our perspective, because in your mind, maybe you've got two doors, but the lender thinks you only have one house, which is fantastic. Helps you out long term, which is really cool. Um, man, like uh, a lot of good stuff here. And uh, I mean, I think just in, in closing thoughts from my perspective here, uh, right off the bat, number one mindset, you know, around this, just shift your mind from a, a, that scarcity. I have to save, 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 save. I can't spend to, okay, where's the opportunity? Where's the opportunity? I can get more, but where is it? You just have to figure out where it is and find it. The second thing is, is obviously, like you just mentioned right away, a guy like you is willing to obviously for a cost, but uh, share all your ideas and strategies with people like come in, uh, I mean, Dean and I, uh, as partners, we, we pay for uh, a coach, a mentor to help us in our business, um, not because we can't figure it out, but because it makes so much more sense to talk to someone who's already been there to help and guide us and eliminate a lot of the mistakes that he's already made. So we don't have to do those again. Funny enough, he's the one who recommended The Big Leap to us. So we, we're familiar with that book, which is uh, super cool. Um, uh, so that so that second piece. And then the third piece is just the confidence. Hey, like I can do this. I can get into my first property. I can, you know, quote unquote, house hack. It's okay to have a roommate for a couple months or a year or whatever and uh, look at those opportunities. So those are those are three key things. So I'm not I'm not going to let you talk too much more on on uh, on the, the other items that we want to touch on because we're going to come back. We're going to have you on. We're going to talk a little, a little bit about some of the big mistakes you've made in the past because we want to dig deep on that. I know everybody likes to hear about those mistakes. But we're going to talk a little bit more about, you know, what it looks like if you're at a different stage in your life and you have homes or you have a home, maybe one or two, and you're like, okay, now like I, I got to do something. I got to figure out and what those people are going to do and a little bit more about the property management piece. But in closing, um, you know, maybe uh, Jared, you can talk to us a little bit more about this program, um, who it's for, how they can reach out to you and, uh, and maybe just some details. So great, really quick uh, for the next segment, for those listeners who have that one house or those two houses with some equity, I, I will next, next time we talk, I will flat out tell you how to, play the game without stressing out and leveraging out your personal life. You know, there's, I don't believe in refinancing your property and leveraging it out to the nines and adding all this stress. I think there's a different way to play the game that can keep balance and structure uh, while leveraging out just a little bit and buying different properties that are going to increase your cash flow. So if you, if, if, if a listener is sitting there and they have half a million dollars of equity in their house, like uh, next episode, I'll tell you how to pull it out. I'll show you and explain to you how to, play the game that you're going to take that and go get a couple million dollars worth of real estate while increasing your cash flow while still allowing you to sleep at night, which is key. 
Um, the coaching program is rad, man. Like we started it in 2017, 2018. We started with a small group and it was the first evolution or the first run of the coaching program. So I had six couples at a table and we used to meet once a month. And I look at those six couples at the table and we met for eight months. It was rad. It was so much fun. And so I, I kind of got away from it because we got into one-on-one -on -one coaching after that, which we still do one-on-one -on -one coaching. Um, and the one-on-one -on -one coaching is awesome too. But so we're going to go back to the drawing board and take these under 30 uh, investors and nothing against the people who are over 30. It's just, a, you know, I have to draw the line somewhere and we drew the line of the sand at 30. So under 30, you know, it's going to be the person who uh, has been working for a few years. They don't, you know, they don't like their job or they want more opportunity. They want some wealth or they want some pension that they're just not going to get. And we're going to take these 30 kids because I'm, I'm older and we're going to take them for the next eight, nine months and teach them how to understand business, how to understand cycles, how to uh, raise capital, how to do presentations. So once, a month, there's a group call with everybody on the call from all over the country, three hour group call. We're going to have guest speakers. Like Chris and I have been pretty blessed. Like we've had a guy named Anurag Gupta who has uh, worked with Chip Wilson, the founder of Lululemon at the startup. He was our coach. Like we, we have coaches today. I have a guy named John Wyland from LA. He's a masculine feminine coach, a life coach. Alan Kahn, uh, he's with, uh, he's a form leader. Um, like, so we've had all kinds of coaches. We've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on coaching. So we're going to take, Everything we've learned over the last 10-ish years of our personal development, give it to these under 30 kids. So once a month, there's going to be a three-hour group call. I'm going to have guest speakers. We're going to have our topics. We're going to have our agenda. We're going to walk them through the process. All, uh, as well, they're going to have small groups. We call them pods. So you're going to have pods of four where they're going to have assignments. They're going to have how to do presentations, how to give feedback, how to how to ask, you know, so we're going to have a presentation, for example, they're going to have to do, and then they're, then they're going to get real-time feedback. And the feedback is, uh, hey, listen, Alex, what I loved about this podcast today was I loved your attention to detail. I loved your, your strict and your sharpness in your conversation. Um, what I would need more of is I would, need, I would have needed us to start at 8 o'clock versus 8.15. You know, so that's a way to give feedback. That's like, I didn't punch you in the face. It's like, ah, here's what I needed to feel safe and comfortable. It's real time feedback. So we're going to break it, which is everything I've learned on personal development. So we're going to have the main group and then we're going to have pods that these pods are going to teach them how to get feedback to make them really sharp and crisp in when they go to attract money, when they go to deal with a mortgage broker, when they go to deal with a realtor, when they go to deal with their dad uh, or tenants. So it's going to be a pretty rad program. I'm pretty pumped about it. And uh, we're, we're going to start marketing it next week. Unreal. Unreal. Well, hey, guys, uh, again, Jared just said it all. <laughs> Don't really have to add much more to it. Uh, if you need to find out more about that, I believe you're on Instagram, you're on, you're on Facebook, you guys are on the web. We'll link up everything in the show notes so people could check it out and find you uh, on there. Any other places that people should find you and reach out aside from those uh, those links? No, you know, uh, dude, uh, Instagram, Jared and Krista. Uh, Facebook, Jared and Krista, uh, email is info at jkcoaching.ca. Uh, and my personal Instagram is the Jared hope. Um, that's kind of where you find me. Cool. I love it, man. Well, thanks for coming on. We look forward to the next uh, episode that we have you on here in a couple of weeks time. And uh, I'm sure if the guys, Hey, listen, if you got value from this, uh, this type of uh, conversation and this kind of real feedback and real information, obviously always, always send us a DM and let us know. Uh, and of course, re of course, reach out to Jared if you have any questions about his program as well. We'll talk to y'all uh, very soon. And uh, thank you again, Jared. Until next time. Thanks guys. That was rad.